Beyond the Winning Post is brought to you by our stable of sponsors. New Zealand Racing Hall of Famer jockey Lance O'Sullivan retired from the saddle in 2003. He's now a businessman and horse trainer. We caught up with him to find out more. How's that for Tommy? Oh, you beat me to it. How are Lovely, you? Emily. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. What are we up to today? Well, uh, today's, uh, I haven't got a lot, too much planned, but we'll go for a bit of a wander around the farm and uh, yeah, show you what we do here. Awesome, let's go. Tell me about your introduction into racing, Lance. Uh, well, I, I, of course, I come from a racing family. My, my father was a, uh, a jockey, and he would say he was a modest jockey. I suppose I didn't get interested in, in the racing side of it till I was about 13 or 14. Um, you know, we were encouraged to stay at school, uh, although I left after the fifth form. Yeah. I did get fifth form, so we'll yep. see. <laughs> and in those days, you actually had to sit it. So, um, uh, yeah, and I, I started working working in the stable. In those days, you had to do a six months probationer, then another six months non riding probationer before you were granted an apprentice jockey's license. I was a middle of the road apprentice. I'd always finished second or third on the premiership. I was no great shakes, but I think there was a lot more competition back then than as well. So I, I did uh, a five year apprenticeship. Came out of my time. The first year I was out of my time. I rode, I think. Uh, I'd have been 49 winners, and um, the following year I uh, met, a, met a guy on holiday one year in Tahiti of all places, a guy called Stuart Lang. Oh, wow. And so I went from riding 49 winners to him taking over doing my bookings to I think 143 the following year. So yeah. it was certainly a big turnaround, and it yeah. just shows the importance of having somebody who knows the form and knows what they're doing. Tell me about your other businesses outside of the racing industry. Uh, well, I look mainly dairy farming. I started, uh, I had my first dairy farm in 1986. I came out of my time as an apprentice jockey back then with, um, I think I had $63,000. So my first property I purchased was out in the back blocks of Pataru and I think it was just over 400K, which was still a fair bit of money back then, especially when interest rates were 20, 24%. Uh, so I got involved in dairying, to cut a long story short, and um, ended up with a couple of farms, three at one stage, and now we're just back to one now. We've sold one just prior to COVID, mm -hmm. but um, we've decided with dairying, it's, um, you know, it's one of those sort of uh, it's a commodity you're dealing with. The price you know, fluctuates from year to year. It looks good this year, but uh, who's to say next year it's going to be bad? So um, that's been our, really our main source of income, as well as... Um, of course, this property that we're on now, we have the Red Barn, which is, uh, I think, we're the uh, busiest wedding venue in the Waikato. And my wife, Bridget, she runs all that, and she does close to 80-odd um, weddings a year during the wedding season. Mm. Uh, we were also set up for tourism, and I think when COVID hit, she cancelled 136 tours for this season alone, which wow. was, um, you know, that was a, a business that was really starting to really flourish and in fact I think it was actually going to take over the wedding side of it but um, that's going to be some time away now before we get that back on track. How do you do it all, the businesses plus being a trainer? Well I, I'm very fortunate being a trainer where I have Andrew Scott as my um, partner and uh, training partner and he's uh, he's a worker and uh, everybody knows Scotty you know he's a great worker and that's, he's a workaholic to be honest mm. and so I only go to the track sort of five days a week and uh, in, that, in that time, uh, you know, I'm there in the mornings and Andrew's great every day. He fills me on everything that's going on in the stable. And, um, you know, it's, so, so it's sort of two moving parts. After track work in the mornings, I'm back here on the farm and doing other things. The guy who had the, the property before us, a guy called Paul Tidmarsh, he actually set up a lot of these things and we just sort of added to them and oh, there's actually fairies live in here, sometimes you can hear them. It's all glow worms all along there. Okay. All glow worms. So you yeah. come in here at night, it's pretty spectacular. This is actually where the water supplied to the whole property, hence the name Rock Spring. Yeah. There it is. And it's usually okay, we're we're in the middle of a 
is pretty dry at the moment, but it, it runs continuously. But you know, it's, at times it's full, full right oh, to the okay. top. And this is something now we've only just started using for our weddings. It's another service for the brides come down and get photographs, yeah. have a drink down here. You know, it's, it's a pretty cool spot. Lance, what gets you out of bed each morning? Um, well, I suppose you know you got, you got, you need a purpose to get out of bed. You've got to be motivated to do something, and. Uh, the horses are a part of it. I do it. There's nothing more enjoyable than going to the track and having a, a good horse to train. And as most trainers will tell you, that is few and far between. But uh, that's one thing. Um, but I, th I think, you know, I'm always passionate about my trees or, or looking to do something new. I'm only I'm 57 now, but I certainly haven't, you know, not looking to rest on my laurels. We're always looking to do something new, my wife and I. And, uh, you know, it's just looking for that next chapter in our lives, if you like. What do you hope your lasting legacy will be? Um, probably doesn't matter, I'll be dead and gone, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> no, I look, at, look I, it, it's a funny thing, you know, I, I look at a, um, there's a magnificent tree in Matamata and Centennial Drive, and it's right by the pond there, and I look at it and I, I think, who was the clever guy who, or clever woman who had the foresight to plant this tree a hundred and 10 or so years ago and uh, for me you know I've sort of you know I'm still planting trees now I try and plant 50 to 100 every year and I just you know I look at an oak tree and I think well that's going to be standing there for the next 500 or so years mm. and for me you know we'll be here for a short time but those trees will be here for a long time and I just want to see somebody else get the enjoyment that I have out of it in a hundred or so years time. Why do you love racing? Well, I think for me, first of all, it's probably the horse. You know, I've always, um, you know, you get, especially as a trainer, you get very attached to the animal. You know, some of them are, you know, when you send them out there to race on the track, all you want to do is see them come back safe and sound. You know, whether they perform well, it's, of course, it's a bonus if they perform well. But there's nothing more gut-wrenching than your horse not coming back in one piece. And I think it's happened to most trainers at some stage of their career. I love working with the people. There's a lot of good people. I think when I started out, there was a lot of um, trainers and even older jockeys like your David Peaks and that, that gave me a tremendous amount of help. And now I feel that I'm in the position to try and help some other young budding jockey come along. Mm. And I do get a lot of enjoyment out of that. And also the staff, um, we're very fortunate at the moment to have a great staff. And uh, you know, without them, you can't run your business. But uh, you know, the enjoyment and the thrills that they get when you do win you know, that's something that you actually live for. Why do you do what you do? Well, I was sort of born into it in a way. And, you know, I won't be doing this forever as far as training racehorses. Um, you know, I certainly won't be an old trainer. I said that I would never be an old jockey. Well, I thought 39 was old enough. Well, I'm 57 now, and uh, I'd be very surprised if I was still doing this when I'm 60.